Good morning, all. So, shall we make a start? So, hematology, hematopoiesis. Hematology is essentially the components of blood, okay? The cellular and non cellular stuff, you know, the proteins that we find in blood, plasma, things like that. And then um, the second hour will be hematopoiesis, which is basically the location where those components, the cellular components of blood are made, which is principally the bone marrow, and the different precursor forms of those cellular components. And then we'll have a lab afterwards. So that lays the, found, the foundation then for a couple of lectures um, next week on the lymphoid system, which is the lymph, um, different types of lymphoid organs that house many of these cells that we're looking at today. And also, um, uh, we do a lot on lymphocytes and the immune system. Um, I'll briefly mention them today, but we do pretty much have a whole lecture on the immune system and lymphocytes next week as well. But first things first, let's lay the foundation for hematology. Let's see here. Okay, so our learning objectives. So we need to know the components of blood, like the cells, and um, the other um, composition of blood, the proteins and ions and things like that. We want to um, understand what a differential count is, which is basically um, a mechanism to count the different types of cells in blood and how that can be used um, as a diagnostic for various conditions, diseases. And then we need to know the function of all of those cells in blood, what they do and how to recognize them, okay, Spe especially for the lab session. And then um, we, we need to know something about hemostasis, which is basically blood clotting, okay, so know the steps of hemostasis, how blood clots and how the different components of blood that we've already looked at participate in that um, activity. So here are some general features of blood. We consider it a type of connective tissue because it's circulating in the vasculature. So it can obviously connect one part of the body to another. It's transporting gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen throughout the body. It is obviously transporting the cells that carry out functions throughout the body. It's transporting proteins. So it's connecting one part of the body to another. Any signal, anything that's happening in one part of the body may be um, connected to another part of the body through the circulation of blood and proteins throughout the cardiovascular system. Okay, so it's obviously transporting oxygen and conversely carbon dioxide. Waste products that are generated, it's going to be transporting them. Hormones throughout the body, it also helps to transport heat and obviously the cells, the components of blood. And then we'll look at the clinical tests um, of blood, the hematocrit, which is basically the um, packed cell volume of red blood cells, ostensibly, and the differential count looking at the different types of white blood cells and what they tell us about the health of an individual. So here's a hematocrit. So basically this is... Um, just a sample of blood that's put in this very thin centrifuge tube. And then if you centrifuge it, you'll pack the cells down into this volume, and this is the fluid volume. So this percentage of cells to the total, somewhere typically in the 40s, is the hematocrit. It varies a little bit between gender. It varies a little bit between um, children and adults. And it can vary a lot if a person um, has a clinical condition. So in this particular case, this is normal. So this is what, 10, 20, 30, 46%. A person that has insufficient red blood cells, so here 15%, is said to be anemic, okay? Not enough red blood cells. So if they don't have enough red blood cells, they're not getting enough oxygen to the body, so they, you know, they may be passing out. And we'll look at some of the causes of anemia. Sometimes you can have the opposite effect where you have more uh, red blood cells than normal, such as here, polycythemia. So here we're looking at about 65%. This can occur naturally if a person 
um, lives at a high altitude. So people like in Colorado, in um, Denver, okay, will tend to have a higher hematocrit um, naturally than people that live at sea temperature because you know they're a mile high. The um, concentration of oxygen in the air is considerably less, right? So their body compensates by producing more red, red blood cells to take up more oxygen. Now, if you've ever been to Denver, and you stayed there a day or two, um, sometimes after the first day, you'll start to get a bit of a headache. Okay, I do when I go to Denver, and that's because my body is not getting enough oxygen, right? And after a while, it kind of compensates, but initially, I get a bit of a headache whenever I go to Denver because I just, I'm not getting enough oxygen. Okay, so that's the hematocrit. So there's different ways to look at the composition of blood, his whole blood. If we add an anticoagulant, right, such as heparin, to that whole blood, and then we centrifuge it, we will get some different fractions. So we will get the red, red blood cell. Red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. Okay, that's basically the, most of the hematocrit right there. And then on top of the erythrocytes, we have what is called the buffy coat. The buffy coat um, is descriptive of kind of this light, fluffy layer of mostly white cell layers. The, these are the, um, the white cells, i.e. the leukocytes. The leukocytes are cells that have nuclei. Red blood cells have no nuclei. The, the leukocytes, the buffy coat, are the cells that have nuclei, and we're going to be talking a lot about them. And then right on top of this white cell layer, the white cell layer, there's usually a, a thin yellow layer, and these are the platelets. Platelets are fragments of megakarier sites, and these platelets play a role in blood clotting. Okay, and we're going to talk about that at the end. So that's the cellular components, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and fragments of cells, the platelets. Yes? Um, hemophilia. Not necessarily. Depends upon, you may have a different composition of cells within the white layer. You know, I guess there's all different causes of hemophilia, so it may vary. Okay, and then the non-cellular fraction is the plasma. That's basically the fluid that um, is left over. It's going to take a, have a lot of proteins in it, like albumin and um, immunoglobulins, stuff like that. So that's the fractionation of blood if we add an anticoagulant, such as heparin. If we don't add an anticoagulant, the blood will naturally clot. And then when we centrifuge that blood, what is left of the fluid fraction is serum. So in this clot now, this clot will trap all of these cellular components, the, the buffy coat, the um, platelets and so on will all be trapped in this blood clot, and what is left then is just the serum, which is fluid with proteins and ions and things like that. Yes? Plasma, I'm going to have a slide on that momentarily. We'll look at the composition of plasma. Okay, so now if we look at blood and, and look at its fractions, there's the formed elements. So formed elements means cellular material. Um, and that consists, the major fraction are the red blood cells. The other term are erythrocytes. Same, we're talking about the same thing here. Red blood cells, erythrocytes, synonymous. You can use them interchangeably. Then we also have white blood cells. That's the buffy coat layer. And the other term for white blood cells are leukocytes. And we also have that thin, very thin layer of yellow material on top of the, the white cells, the white blood cells, which are the platelets, okay? So these are the formed elements of blood. This is all cellular or fragments of cells, and we're going to look at these in greater detail. Then the non-cellular material is the plasma, which consists of water and solutes, and we'll break the solutes down momentarily. Differential count. Okay, this is a very basic first pass test for anybody that may be ill um, or not even not ill to see what is the composition of the cellular composition of their blood. Um, in the old days, a differential count was performed under a microscope and the different types of cells counted under a microscope to determine the percentages. So before you can count anything, you have to 
pr create a smear. So what would happen is we'd do a pin finger prick, get a drop of blood on a microscope slide, then we take another slide on top and we pull that slide back up to the drop of blood. And then when you touch that drop of blood, it's going to um, run along the interface between the, between the two slides. And then you push that top slide forward, as shown here, and it gives you this feathered edge where the concentration of cells back here is much thicker than down here where it peters out to nearly nothing. You dry the blood smear on the slide and then you stain that, that smear with Romanovsky type stains and invented more than 100 years ago, um, different types of components of Romanovsky stains. So basophilic cells we call blue, azurophilic purple, eosinophilic orange, neutrophilic pink. Now in here somewhere, because you, there's a high concentration to a low concentration, there's going to be an optimal region where firstly the cells aren't stacked on top of each other because you can't count them properly if they're stacked on top of each other way back here. And down here they're too spread out to see much, but in, in the middle somewhere there's going to be optimal concentration where the cells aren't stacked, but you can see them sufficiently to be able to count them. So you'd have, have a micrometer, it had a little grid, you'd count the cells, there's a little formula and you'd calculate the concentration of different types of cells in the smear. Luckily, these days it's automated. We have machines that do it and it's much more accurate. There's, a, there's a many, many of these different machines. So you just put your sample of blood in here and it goes into the machine and the machine has some dyes in there um, that will stain the different types of cellular components of the blood and it creates a scatter diagram, a scattergram and these are the cells and it tells you that okay, this is the cluster of lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils and here it is here I guess schematically and it will automatically calculate the percentage of each of those different types of cells for you and give you a nice little printout. Now it turns out this is the most routine thing that's done in hospitals like at Georgetown University Hospital they do I'm told more than 500 every day so like in the morning um, has anyone ever been hospitalized overnight? Okay, so in the morning, you probably remember, first thing, like at 6 or 7 a.m., they do the rounds and a, um, the intern or whoever the, will come around and he will look at your chart, right? They come around first thing in the morning. Firstly, to check that you're still alive. That's good, still alive, we can continue. And um, they look at your chart and by that time, they will have had the differential count done for you because maybe a couple of hours earlier the nurse had taken a sample of blood and they took it down to the laboratory in the hospital and they did a differential count performed by one of these machines. The hospitals have probably got many and more industrial size. And so every patient that's hospitalized overnight typically will have a differential count done every day because that way they can compare yesterday to today to see whether there's been any change in status of their blood, okay, and we'll see the significance of that. So this is the most basic thing that, other than just a physical exam by a doctor, that, and a very easy and very uh, instructive. Like every year, I have my, um, I have a, 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 you know, I have my annual um, physical with my doctor, and before I actually go and meet with my doctor, he gives me a little script or his nurse gives me a script and I go to a laboratory, they take a blood sample, they do a differential count. So a week later when I actually meet with my doctor, he's got a printout of my differential count. And we, and actually what I do, because I know what's going on here, I get the nurse to give me a printout before I even walk in to see the doctor. And so I'm flipping through the pages to see what's going on, okay? And believe me, I've learned a few things about myself over the years by flipping through the pages. A couple of surprises um, and I can talk about that as we get to it. So anyway, it's very informative. And so if you've, if you've ever had these, I mean you, you guys may be a little bit too young to be having an annual physical. Who's had an annual physical with their doctor? Does anyone go regularly and did they draw blood and do this sort of stuff? If they did, what you should do after from now on is before you actually meet with your doctor, ask the nurse to print it out for you because it's yours. You paid for it, right, through your insurance. You paid for it, it's yours. So get the printout and you can look at it and you know you can discuss it with the doctor because after today you'll be able to review your own 
differential count and you can ask him questions. What about this? What about that? Because it actually flags. If you're out of the normal range, it'll tag it and it'll say, yeah, you know, sometimes that uh, means something wrong with you, sometimes not. Okay? Sometimes there, there's, in, there's sort of biological variation between individuals where sometimes it's outside of the normal range, but it's meaningless. It's a difference without um, a, a, a clinical consequence. So you can learn all these things as we go along. So here's our differential count. Here's, this is the big picture. If nothing else, you really need to, to know this slide um, in terms of significance. These are the types of leukocytes. So not red blood cells. Leukocytes are cells with nuclei and their function. So we will see when we look at the nucleated cells, the most common nucleated cell is the neutrophil. And neutrophils, their function is to attack parasites. Okay? Parasites, parasitic infections, which is all the time. You've got parasite, you've got bacteria. I, mean, I should say not, not parasites, bacteria. You've got bacteria in you all the time, just from breathing, from eating. You've got them in there. The neutrophils are um, destroying them by phagocytosis. Then we also have eosinophils, much less frequent. They do attack parasites, helminthic worms, things like that. Um, not much less frequent. Hopefully you don't have a parasitic infection. Basophils, um, the least common of all, they mediate inflammation. So when you get a mosquito bite or um, uh, a mosquito bite, bee sting, something like that, and you get a, a, um, a bump, inflamed, like you get the mosquito bite, it's inflamed, you get localized edemia. Edema, basophils and mast cells are what cause that. Lymphocytes, we're not going to talk much about them today. We'll talk about them. There's a whole lecture on them next week. They mediate immunity, and there's different types of immunity. Humoral immunity is the immunity where um, these B lymphocytes produce antibodies, or at least they differentiate into plasma cells and produce antibodies. Or cellular immunity where T lymphocytes will actually um, directly um, lies through uh, cytotoxically lies uh, infected cells. But we'll talk about that in great detail next week. And then monocytes you also have in the blood. Um, and these can become phagocytic. Okay, they can differentiate into macrophages. They can differentiate into uh, Kupfer cells of the, um, the, of the liver, um, Langerhans cells of the skin, glial cells of the nervous system. Um, so monocytes can differentiate into a, a whole bunch of different phagocytic type cells. So that's the big picture. That's, what, that's all of the major types of leukocytes that you will find and the percentages more or less that you will find in a, under normal conditions if you're not ill. If you're ill, you may see those percentages change up or down and that would be informative um, as to perhaps what, where to further look at. So here's our, here's our differential count. Here's our blood smear stained with hematoxylin and eosin. So we can see the red blood cells, right? No nucleus. Then we can see these cells over here with nuclei. So this is an eosinophil because it contains these eosinophilic stained granules. This is a neutrophil containing neutrophilic granules and a basophil containing these large basophilic stained granules. These three cell types have a lobulated nucleus. You can't see the lobulations too clearly in the basophil because the basophilic granules are so large that they cover it over. So these three guys we call um, granular sites because they contain large granules and in addition their nuclei are lobulated. Then over here we have our lymphocyte which is more or less a rounded nucleus and a thin rim of cytoplasm and a monocyte where the nuclear shape can be quite variable so identification of monocytes can sometimes be a little challenging and the best way to do it is and if it's a normal um, blood smear by um, deletion or subtraction i.e., is this cell a lymphocyte or a granulocyte? No, then it must be a monocyte. Okay, so that's the best way to identify monocytes. We also have platelets shown here, which is small fragments of megakaryocytes. The platelets are the cells that participate in the clotting of blood. And by coincidence, not meant necessarily meant to be shown here, we have a band cell. When we do hematopoiesis in the second hour we will be talking about band cells. This is a precursor cell um, that's been released early to, in this case, probably a neutrophil. Okay? If you have an excess, and usually it's normal to have about maybe 1% of band cells 
in a differential count under if you're normally healthy. If you have an excess of band cells, let's say two or three percent in the blood, that means your blood is your body is um, ramped up the production of perhaps neutrophils because we know neutrophils major function is attacking parasites. So an excess of band cells would be indicative perhaps of a parasitic infection. Okay. So then by knowing the composition of the blood and the, what the different types do and the deviation from the normal percentages in the blood, you can get a hint initially as to maybe what could be going on with that person. So remember that band cell because you might want to see a good example of them as we go forward. So now let's go in detail and discuss each of these different types of components of the blood. First we'll do the granulocytes. Okay, remember we're talking about all of the cells that have nuclei. The leukocytes, i.e. the white blood cells, all contain nuclei. We just looked at them. And we further subdivide the leukocytes into the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. The granulocytes have the large granules when there's three types, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. We're going to look at these in turn. So here's our granulocytes, the eosinophil, neutrophil, basophil. We're going to look at these three granulocytes because they have prominent granules in the cytoplasm. The other way to identify the granulocytes, of course, also is that they have lobulated nuclei, whereas lymphocytes and monocytes don't. At least the monocytes don't have much of a lobulated nucleus, depending upon what it looks like. But these have very prominent lobulated nuclei, so you can identify granulocytes both on the uh, size of the granules and the color of the granules and also on the nucleus because it's lobulated. And then if it's not a granulocyte, it's an A granulocyte. If you see A in front of um, something, that means not. A granular, okay? Not granular. A typical, not typical. So if you go to the doctor and he says, you have atypia, that means he doesn't have a clue what's wrong with you because he's saying it's not typical, okay? Atypia, okay, what? what? Sounds, sounds important, oh yeah, sounds impressive. I've got atypia, no, I've got, uh, he doesn't have a clue. So, <laughs> go see somebody else. So A in front of a word means not, okay? So A granulocytes, not granulocytes, which comprises lymphocytes and monocytes. So here's our A granulocytes, here's our lymphocyte, and here's our monocyte. Okay, and then um, if we, so that's the this, this formed elements of the blood. Well, there's also platelets that we'll get to in a moment, which is a fragment of a cell. And then there's plasma, which is the fluid component. So remember, plasma is formed if we add an anticoagulant such as heparin and centrifuge down the, the uh, blood, the red blood cells, the buffy coat, which is the the erythrocytes, the white blood cells, and then this little fuzzy yellow layer of, um, of platelets. But now we want to look at the plasma, the fluid component. So the plasma is mostly water, shown here, but in that water there are solutes. Solutes means you know, it's more substantial stuff. And most of the solutes are proteins, and the major constituent is albumin. Okay. I'm sure you've all heard of albumin, right? And then globulins, such as immunoglobulins. So immunoglobulins would primarily be antibodies. In addition to the proteins, we may have small organic molecules. We might have fragments of proteins. We might have peptides. We might have amino acids, OK? So they're small organics. And then inorganic molecules, maybe ions, potassium, sodium, chloride, stuff like that. So here's the composition of plasma. So if we look at, again at the plasma, the proteins, the albumin is the major constituent. And albumin plays a major role in osmotic pressure. Okay, So it's the major proteinaceous component that makes the, the blood a little bit thicker. It also can act as a loose binding protein to carry other um, proteins with it. Then we have the globulins, which includes the immunoglobulins. These are the antibodies. And we also have transport globulins that can bind other things like ions, hormones, other compounds. And then we have fibrinogen, which is a major component of the blood clotting cascade. We'll talk about that at the end of the lecture today. So we want that around in case you cut yourself, in case there's a break, we need fibrinogen to form blood clots. So in addition to the plasma proteins, we have small organic, prote small organic compounds such as lipids, right? Cholesterol, fatty acids. 
carbohydrates, glucose, right? Amino acids I mentioned. Sometimes some organic waste, urea, creatine, bilirubin from the liver. And then the inorganics will be electrolytes, all of these guys, okay? So that is the composition primarily, the composition of plasma under normal conditions. So now we've kind of got an idea of the cellular and the non-cellular components of blood. Let's go back now and look at these different components in detail. So the first thing we want to look at are red blood cells. Here's a picture of some red blood cells. So the first thing we note about red blood cells, in humans, there's no nucleus, which is very informative. Because if you have no nucleus, you can no longer perform transcription or translation of new proteins. So you can't repair damaged proteins in the cell. Okay? So that means because you can't do repairs to this red blood cell, it has a limited lifespan. Okay? Now, not all animals have red, have red blood cells without nuclei. So, um, for instance, um, as an example, um, chickens have nuclei in their red blood cells. So there's been stories of people that have tried to fake the death of somebody or other or fake an injury for, um, for insurance purposes. And so, you know, the, the forensic pathologist will come in and he'll take some blood sample because blood is a component of connective tissue. They'll take a blood sample, they'll take it back to the lab, they'll look under the microscope and they say, hold up, wait a minute, these red, blood, these red blood cells have nuclei. This is not human, so claim denied, okay? So, so you know, there was no injury, there was no, there was no uh, death. It was, they faked it with chicken blood or some other animal um, that has nuclei. So um, there are differences between animals as to whether there's a nucleus or not in the red blood cell. But humans have no red blood cells, so that is important in a number of different ways. So here's a, uh, an electron micrograph of a um, red blood cell in cross-section, kind of has this drumstick-shaped appearance. And <clears throat> this is kind of interesting. See how it becomes very narrow here? That's very useful in terms of bending. You can imagine <coughs> because of the shape of this red blood cell, it's quite flexible. So you need that flexibility to be able to squeeze that red blood cell through the smallest capillaries during, during circulation of blood through the body to allow for the release of oxygen and uptake of carbon dioxide at the tissue level, i.e. small capillaries. This is also a picture of a platelet, a fragment of omega carrier site that's available to facilitate blood clotting. We'll get to that later. Okay, so here's another picture of these red blood. This is a blood vessel here. It's branched here. So here's the lumen of the blood vessel that branches here. So one branch goes here. One branch goes here, and you can see how these red blood cells are quite flexible. They, c they can kind of fold, so in, under pressure, they can squeeze down through these really small capillary blood vessels to the smallest tissue level to facilitate gaseous exchange. So the absence of a nucleus actually facilitates the function, in, in humans at least, of gaseous exchange. And here's another picture of the same thing. Okay. Um, integrity of the erythrocyte, uh, its lifespan is limited and um, it depends upon the cell membrane, hemoglobin and metabolic enzymes which will break down after about 120 days upon which they will be removed, the red blood cells. So in the membrane of red blood cells we have a couple of three major proteins that we need to talk about. There's glycophorin shown here. There's an anion transporter channel, you can see the channel here. And this channel is important because it allows um, bicarbonate and carbon dioxide to exchange, and that exchange facilitates carbon dioxide release in the lungs. Okay, so that's important. And this anion transporter channel is bound via anchorin, this protein here, bound to intracellular cytoskeleton. So it's holding it, um, holding this, this channel to the intracellular cytoskeleton. Okay, blood groups. Does anybody know their blood group? Any, let's, who's A? It's pretty rare. Who's B? It's pretty rare. Who's AB? Rarest of them all. And who is O? Okay. So this is how you get the ABO blood group. There's 
a lot of different blood groups, but the ABO is, I think, probably the oldest and the most well-known. So basically, on the surface of the red blood cell, there is a sequence of sugar residues, saccharides, that are linked through a lipid to the plasma membrane. So here's the plasma membrane of the red blood cell. Here's the cytoplasm in here. So on the outside, you've got this sequence of sugars. And if you have this collectors, glucose collectors, and acetyl glucosamine collectors, fucose, that gives you the O antigen blood group. If you add, in this location, a N acetyl galactosamine, that gives you the A antigen. Or if you add, in this location, another galactose, that gives you the B antigen. And that's simply it. By simply changing or adding one small saccharide moiety to the end of this chain, that will determine your blood group, okay? Okay, so one of the major functions of red blood cells, or the major function of red blood cells, is gas exchange. So obviously they're important for the uptake of oxygen in the lungs and the release of carbon dioxide from the capillaries in the lungs um, back into the lungs. Now, sickle cell anemia. We are, hopefully, we've all heard of sickle cell anemia. This is caused by a point mutation in the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the molecule in the red blood cell that's carrying the oxygen. And if you have a small point mutation where a glutamic acid is changed to a valine, that renders that, uh, that red blood cell, that erythrocyte, relatively inflexible and changes its shape, okay? It has more of a sickle cell shape, no longer that drumstick shape. And because um, it now has a change in shape, as we'll see next week, that renders that red blood cell somewhat inflexible and it's prematurely removed by the spleen. We'll learn that the spleen is the filter of the blood, where aged red blood cells normally are removed, but if you have sickle cell anemia, the spleen thinks that um, this red blood cell is old, whereas it may not be old, and it will prematurely remove the sickle cell, red blood cell, from the body. And that is what gives rise to the physical manifestation of sickle cell anemia. So there are a number of different causes of anemia. So we define ne anemia as a low concentration of hemoglobin in the circulatory system, in the blood. There are a number of causes. One of them is four main ones. Loss of blood, hemorrhage, okay? Trauma, car accident, okay? Gunshot. You lose a lot of blood, okay? So now you've got reduced amounts of red blood cells, reduced amounts of hemoglobin. Or you can have an insufficient production of red blood cells, a number of different causes. One that um, comes to mind is a diseased kidney, okay? So my father-in-law, before he passed away, had his kidneys shut down, so he would have to go have dialysis, okay? Now the kidneys make a protein called erythropoietin, sometimes called EPO for short. And that erythropoietin makes its way from the kidneys into the blood and into the bone marrow to stimulate the production of red blood cells. So if your kidneys are diseased and have shut down, there's no EPO, so that means the body is not making sufficient numbers of red blood cells, okay, because the kidneys aren't making the EPO. So then that person will become anemic. So when people go to get um, dialysis, in addition to the dialysis cleaning the toxins out of the blood, they have to add EPO into the blood of the patient that's having the dialysis so that their body will continue to make the right number of red blood cells. Another cause of anemia may be insufficient, uh, insufficient iron, okay? So what can cause insufficient iron? Pregnancy. You probably, you may um, know somebody that's had a baby and quite often, or during their pregnancy, they will get an iron supplement from the pharmacy because the fetus is acting as a parasite and is sucking all of the nutrients and everything it needs from the mother. And one of the things that it's taking out from the mother is iron, okay? So the mother-to-be, will take an iron supplement to um, restore the normal amount of iron in her body and have enough iron to give to the fetus during the pregnancy, 
And another cause of anemia, accelerated red blood cell destruction, sickle cell anemia, we just discussed that momentarily ago. So here are some common causes, well-known causes of anemia. There are many more, but these are four that I just wanted to um, list because these are ones that we can come across quite regularly. Yes? Tend to what? Crave ice. Who craves ice? I haven't heard of that. Um, so you create. So you, did they figure out you were internally bleeding? Okay. Um, craving ice. So then you would be feeling too hot. I don't know, maybe your body somehow is reacting to the bleeding, generating heat, but I'm not sure what the, the, what, what the whole pathway is there. Okay, let's carry on. So now, let's look at the life cycle of red blood cells. <clears throat> red blood cells are made normally in the bone marrow. It takes about a week or so, whereupon they're released and we call them um, reticulocytes because they contain a little bit of um, RNA stain material, which just lasts a day or two, and then we see them as mature red blood cells. And they will circulate, <coughs> pardon me, for about 120 days. But remember, they have no nucleus, so they cannot repair or replace damaged proteins. So their lifespan is limited because they're getting banged around by being knocking into other cells in the walls of blood vessels. They're also coming into contact with various compounds that may be, um, you know, ch changing the proteins in some day, damaging the proteins, oxidizing the proteins, who knows what. And so then, they, after that, they become relatively inflexible, and they're removed from the blood. Most of that removal occurs in the spleen, um, lesser amounts in the liver and the bone marrow by, um, in the spleen, by phagocytosis, typically. A lesser amount, about 10%, may actually occur in the blood vessels. So you can have macrophages in the blood vessels that will recognize <coughs> a damaged red blood cell and just phagocytose it. So that's the normal lifespan of a red blood cell. Okay, so much for the red blood cells. Let's go on now to the granular sites. The first of which we're going to discuss is the neutrophil, which is the most common lobulated nuclear cell in the blood. Okay, sometimes they're called polymorphonuclear leukocytes, i.e. polys for short, or neutrophils. Those terms are synonymous. I might use them interchangeably. You can see the nucleus is lobulated, and you can see these neutrophilic granules in the cytoplasm, just at the level of resolution. As a neutrophil ages, it becomes more lobulated. So it starts out as a band cell. Remember that I talked about that band cell in the upper uh, left-hand corner of that um, differential count slide. starts out as a band cell, and that horseshoe-shaped nucleus then becomes lobulated. So it'll, it'll become you know, two or three lobules and four or five. If you see m five or six lobules, that means it's the aged neutrophil. Now it's ready to hit the you know, kick the bucket and pass and be um, replaced. Now sometimes we may see this small drumstick-like appendage sticking off the nucleus. This is called a bar body. And this is, in fact, an inactivated X chromosome. So this sample of blood came from a female, right? Because females have two X chromosomes. Only one X chromosome typically is active in any cell. The other is inactivated as a bar body. And in this particular case, in neutrophils, it um, comes out to the side. So if you look at a blood smear and you look at the neutrophils, if you look a sufficient number of neutrophils, you may see a bar body that would allow you to identify the gender of the person. You may not necessarily see a bar body, like in this one you can't see it, because presumably this little drumstick appendage is maybe underneath one of these lobules. Okay? So you need to look at a number of different neutrophils to definitively identify the gender of that blood smear. So. In a schematic, the neutrophil has two different granules. There's the non-specific granules. These are simply primary lysosomes. We know all about primary lysosomes from the cell organelle lecture, right? 
and they do what null lysosomes do. And we have specific granules, which are more of a salmon pink color. These are the granules that give rise to the color of the neutrophil, okay? Neutrophils are able to move um, out of blood vessels to a site of infection by a process of diapodesis and chemotaxis. So diapodesis refers to the ability of these neutrophils to exit a blood vessel and squeeze between the lining endothelial cells into the connective tissue space. And then chemotaxis, chemochemical taxis movement, right? the chemotaxis, they migrate toward a chemotactic factor that actually might have been um, released by a basophil or a mast cell at this location of bacterial infection. So then the, the, the neutrophils are, can migrate, have the capacity to migrate to sites of infection. Okay, so how do neutrophils kill bacteria? Remember the main function of neutrophils is to destroy bacteria. There's kind of two main mechanisms. One of them is an oxygen-dependent mechanism. So what happens in the oxygen-dependent mechanism is that oxygen, so in here, in, in, within the cytoplasm, is converted into a, a superoxide radical, which then can be um, converted into hydrogen peroxide, and we know how reactive hydrogen peroxide is. It's kind of a form of a bleach that then can be further converted by an enzyme, myeloperoxidase, uh, in the presence of chloride ions to hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid shown here. So what is hypochlorous acid? Hypochlorous acid is bleach, okay? When you're cleaning the countertop of the kitchen or the bathroom, you know, quite often you'll use a bleach and there's different types of bleaches, but if you look at the constituents of the bleach, sometimes it's hydrogen peroxide, sometimes it's hypochlorous acid and other things. So what we have here is that evolution has stumbled upon the ability of bleach to kill bacteria. So, you know, evolution figured it out millions and millions of years ago. It wasn't the pharma companies or the, the companies that sell you this stuff that suddenly discovered bleach as a form of killing bacteria. Neutrophils have been doing it for um, millions and millions of years through this mechanism shown here. That's the oxygen-dependent pathway. The oxygen-independent pathway, as you might expect, is basically lysosomal degradation. Okay, lysosomes with all of their, their um, proteolytic enzymes can destroy um, uh, bacteria as well. Okay, now, sometimes some of these cells, such as neutrophils, may inadvertently damage DNA and it's thought possibly cause cancer. So you've got these neutrophils that are attacking bacteria in the connective tissue, okay? And they're releasing, perhaps inadvertently, these bleach-type compounds, hydrogen peroxide, hypochlorous acid. Question? Uh, no. Not that I, that's a diff, that would be a different cell organelle um, that would possibly also um, attack bacteria if they're phagocytosed, but that's different. But the neutrophils, when they're attacking these bacteria, sometimes they may inadvertently uh, leak some of the hydrogen peroxide or other what they call reactive oxygen species, okay? So these reactive oxygen species are highly reactive, contain an oxygen component, okay, it's hypochlorous acid. And these reactive oxygen species, which includes hypochlorous acid, hydrogen peroxide, and so on, may inadvertently leak from these cells and damage normal cells, okay? They're damaging some normal cells in the vicinity of this infection. And so when these normal cells repair, and it may damage the DNA of those normal cells. So when these normal cells are repairing their DNA, sometimes you may get a mismatch repair and you may get a mutation in the nucleotides of the DNA that may get locked in as a mutation. Now a lot of the time, a single mutation may have no consequence. 
But over a lifetime, if you have chronic infections over the, the span of your life, you may have multiple infections. Some of them may be low grade and you don't even realize it. And you may eventually accumulate these mutations. And if you accumulate these mutations and they happen to be inappropriate and you have some bad luck, it may cause some of those cells to become cancerous. Okay? So over a lifetime, you could appreciate that if you have chronic inflammation through this mechanism, you can have inadvertent damage of DNA over a lifetime that eventually may cause some of these cells to become cancerous. Evidence to support that, in addition to experimental evidence, is the fact that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have been shown to actually inhibit certain types of cancers, particularly colon cancer is probably the best well-known. So when I'm talking about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, I'm talking about aspirin, ibuprofen, Celebrex, um, acetaminophen, things like that, right? So not only are, you do, are those drugs, um, you take them for, uh, for headaches and also for fever, but they also reduce inflammation. And certain people chronically take these anti-inflammatory drugs for other reasons, like people that have arthritis, right? Some people, for whatever reason, have arthritis at an early age and throughout their life, or you know, typically older people tend to get arthritis. So we know from epidemiological studies that people that have been taking these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs over the long term, large um, parts of their life, have a reduced incidence of certain cancers, okay? They have lower incidence of cancers, like particularly colon cancer, and people that have a family history of colon cancer are actually prescribed these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to suppress the um, onset of the colon cancer, okay? So that is evidence, epidemiological evidence, that chronic inflammation, not just one hit, but chronic inflammation over the long term may damage DNA and cause cancer. Okay, so we talked about um, diapodesis and chemotaxis of our um, neutrophils, being able to get out of the blood vessel, takes about six hours, squeeze through, migrate towards our site of infection, shown here. So remember, neutrophils are the most common cellular component of blood, so when you have pus, if you have a little splinter and it appears white, a lot of that white appearing uh, material uh, of the pus is an accumulation of neutrophils in and around that splinter or whatever else it was that was causing you um, that, that problem. There's our neutrophils, just 60 to 70 percent. The next cell type is the eosinophil. Eosinophils contain these eosinophilic granules. They are also lobulated, as shown here lobulated nucleus. Eosinophils we can identify in the electron micrograph because they have these specific granules with a stripe, okay? This stripe. And this stripe contains, and we call this stripe the internum, and the outside of the stripe, this lattice color material, is the externum. This internum contains a major basic protein that attacks parasites, such as um, helminthic worms, okay? So then that's the major function of eosinophils, to attack parasitic infections. Here's an example. Here's a larva of a parasite, and you can see all of these eosinophils that are attacking this schistosome larva right here, okay? And now eosinophils will migrate also by diabetes and chemotaxis to a site of a parasitic infection in response to a protein called eosinophil chemotactic factor that is actually secreted by the basophils, which we're going to talk about next. So basophils might get there. They say, hey, we've got an inflammatory response and an infection. They secrete this eosinophil chemotactic factor, which will recruit eosinophils from the blood, migrate through the connective tissue to the site of infection. So here's our eosinophils. We're going to look at these in the lab today, identify um, the, the histologically unique and distinguishing feature of eosinophils is the stripe in the granule. So that's what we look, to look for. And once an infection is almost done, then the eosinophils can um, turn off the uh, reaction, the inflammatory reaction. 
So there's our eosinophils, 2 to 4 percent. The next is our basophils, which is the last of the three granulocytes. So these are all red blood cells. Here's our, our basophil. Here's the nucleus, kind of can't make out the lobulation too clearly because these basophilic granules are so large, they cover everything and fill the cytoplasm. Basophils contain the lobulated nucleus and these large basophilic granules, which contains heparin, which is an anticoagulant, some proteases, histamine, which is um, a vasodilator, or it increases the permeability, I should say, of blood vessels to allow um, and promote localized edema, i.e. fluid accumulating at the site of the um, inflammatory response. And of course the basophils, as I just mentioned, also secrete eosinophil chemotactic factor. So they function in inflammation, localized edema, and of course we know they recruit eosinophils. So when you have a basophil degranulating, an inflammatory response, you have on the surface two IgE molecules, okay, immunoglobulin E molecules, that when an antigen comes into contact with these two IgE molecules, cross-links them. So let's just say this is a B sting, protein from a B sting. This B sting protein cross-links the two IgE molecules. That causes um, intracellular proteins um, immediately beneath the IgE to um, come into contact, maybe change conformation, and initiate a signaling event, a signal transduction event that can lead to calcium mobilization and fusion of granules with each other and eventually with the membrane releasing heparin, eosinophil chemotactic factor, um, and so on. So basophils are similar to mast cells in that they mediate an inflammatory response. So here they calling it a mast cell, but it's basophils and mast cells are very similar in function. So this is showing you a sequence of events where the mast cell basophil can initiate asthma. So a person may breathe in an allergen. That allergen makes its way across the respiratory epithelium of the lungs and makes contact with a mast cell or a basophil. You get cross-linking of the two IgE molecules, and then you get degranulation of the mast cell and basophil releasing certain factors, which such as histamine will cause the release of fluid from a blood vessel leading to localized edema, okay, so swelling, fluid accumulation. Um, of course, they also release the eosinophil chemotactic factor, so the eosinophils will migrate also out of the blood vessel to the site of um, of the allergen, okay? And they also release leukotrienes, which is a substance that will promote smooth muscle contraction. So then what you have is smooth muscle contraction in the lungs, and you have fluid, which is kind of pushing on things, so that can lead to asthma and a difficulty of breathing of that individual. That's basophils, rarest of the different types of leukocytes. Now, the two agranulocytes, cells without prominent granules, this is lymphocytes, small rounded nucleus, thin rim of cytoplasm. We're going to talk about those in detail a whole lecture next week, so that's, I just want to mention them. We'll get to them later. Here's what they may look like in an electron micrograph. They're you know, more than a third or a quarter to a third of the cells in the blood, so obviously they play a very important role in um, immune response. We'll talk about that later. The last of the leukocytes that I want to talk about is the monocyte. Monocytes contain different shaped nuclei. Typically you would identify that by subtraction it's not the other A granulocyte, i.e. the leukocyte, and it's not any of the three granulocytes, so then it's a monocyte in normal blood. And monocytes are part of what they call the mononucleophagocytic system, which is a group of cells that um, have slightly different morphology that play a role in phagocytosis. So here's our, in the blood, we get the formation of monocytes that then can differentiate into macrophages, tissue macrophages. So they may migrate out of the blood into the connective tissue space where they become macrophages and phagocytose things. We have other derivatives of monocytes that have a phagocytic function such as cupcell cells in the liver, 
in the bone, you know, we know all about osteoclasts in the bone, right? Fused monocytes, multinucleated um, osteoclasts, they're fused monocytes. In the brain, connected in the um, nervous system, we can have microglia and so on. All of these different cell types that we will see in different tissues and organs have as an origin the monocytes. And then, so then all of these cells and the monocytes, we call them part of the mononuclear phagocytic being the operative word, phagocytic system, because they're phagocytic in function. So what these cells do, such as macrophages, and we'll talk about this in greater detail next week, is that they act also, not only do they phagocytose non-specifically a bacteria and kill it, but they also stimulate the immune system, acquired immunity to produce maybe antibodies or um, T-cell mediated um, cell death through antigen presentation. So macrophages, not only are they phagocytic, they're also an antigen presenting cell, an APC cell. All of those monophagocytic cells I talked about in the previous slide, they're all APCs. What does that mean? What is an antigen presenting cell? So here is our bacteria. And it is phagocytosed by our blue macrophage. And when it's, ma when it's phagocytosed, obviously the macrophage will get a lysosome and fuse it in now our multivesicular body containing our macrophage to destroy the macrophage. Once that um, macrophage is being digested by the lysosome, there may be small peptide fragments that are released from that bacteria, and this small peptide bacterial fragment is bound by what we call the major histocompatibility complex, this goal-shaped structure binding a bit of macrophage. And that presents that little bit of macrophage protein to, in this case, a T lymphocyte. The T lymphocyte has a um, receptor that may recognize that macrophage as foreign, and so then that T helper T cell can stimulate B cells to produce antibodies that then can bind the bacteria. So then that's why we call it an antigen presenting cell. It take, gets a little piece of antigen and it presents it to a helper T cell to stimulate acquired immunity. So macrophages really have two functions in the immune system. They are non-specifically phagocytic, um, but they're also playing a role in acquired immunity in stimulating an immune response. And we're going to talk about that in much greater detail next week. Okay, then the last of the cells, monocytes. We know all about monocytes. They're part of the um, antigen-presenting cell family. The other formed element are platelets. We're almost done. Platelets um, are these fragments of cells released from the bone marrow. And when we look at a schematic of the platelet on the outside, we talk about a hylomere, which consists of microfilaments and microtubules, so actin and microtubules. And in the center, we have granules. Um, some of these granules are lysosomal. Some of them dense core, dense core granules or delta granules secrete serotonin for vasoconstriction. Alpha granules secrete platelet-derived growth factor, which promotes the endothelial cell lining of broken blood vessels to undergo mitosis for repair. They also play a role, in, importantly, in hemostasis. In other words, repair of vascular injury. And there's three steps to hemostasis. So if you cut yourself and you start to bleed, the first thing is that those ends of the blood vessels constrict a little bit, OK? That helps to reduce blood loss. Then the platelets that are leaking out through the blood will adhere to the collagen fibers in the extracellular space, right immediately beneath the basement membrane. You're going to have probably collagen fibers. And the platelets preferentially like to bind to the collagen. So that's going, the platelets then are going to act as kind of a plug, kind of you know when the sink gets clogged up with junk, okay, they're clogging up the, the leaking blood vessel. And then the platelets release fibrinogen which will, and, and a number of other factors which promote the blood clotting cascade where fibrinogen eventually will, uh, through a bunch of biochemical reactions, become fibrin, which acts as a net or a mesh to hold the platelets and other cellular components together and form a nice hard blood clot. Okay? So there's those three steps in hemostasis that is mediated in part by the platelets where they aggregate to plug up the leak and release components of the blood clotting cascade 
to produce fibrin and also plug up the, the um, leak. Now, hemostasis um, is shown here. So here's the initial vasoconstriction, and also you have exposure of collagen fibers. The platelets aggregate on the collagen fibers, and fibrinogen further will form a mesh to clog up this um, break. Now, sometimes people have a disease or diseases relating to components of the blood clotting cascade. So um, part of this cascade involves a protein called von Willebrand's factor, which binds factor eight from blood plasma to form fibrin. Now, some people are hemophilic, okay? There's different types of hemophilia. And femihilia is an absence of factor eight. So it's like a congenital condition. And so in the absence of factor eight, they're not gonna be clogging up the blood plasma as efficiently, so they bleed very easily, okay? So they can bleed to deaths from um, what you and I would be a simple injury. So who has hemophilia? Well, we know a lot of the royalty in Europe are hemophiliacs, right? Or more so than the general population. So for instance, the last Tsar of Russia and his family, um, they had a lot of hemophilia in the family, right? So um, you may be aware of that. So because, you know, in Europe, the royalty likes to keep the money in the family, so they kind of marry each other. So that kind of perpetuates the congenital transfer of hemophilia from one person to another within that small select group of individuals. Okay, and this picture simply shows you these platelets binding to the collagen fibers, okay, in a cut. Here is a typical differential count. This is my differential count from a couple of years ago. So this is what you'll see, okay, so here's the white, the, the um, leukocytic count, red cell counts, and then it gives you the, um, the range, what's normal and what's not normal. Here's the hematocrit, okay, 45. This is normal, what's not normal. And then, <clears throat> like the machine, will do a whole bunch of other things where they're looking at volume, okay, size, concentration, stuff like that. So these things will um, be flagged if there's something that's out of the normal that will um, say maybe there's a problem here. Like usually there's seven pages. Okay, this you can see page two or page seven. Like my last, um, when I had my last uh, um, doctor's visit, my physical diagnosis, for the last five years my bilirubin count's been high outside of the normal range. Usually it's up to 1.4, mine's been two or more. So bilirubin, you know, like uh, causes jaundice, right? Little babies get, because the liver's not, and also older people, if their liver's, if they've got cancer of the liver, you'll have elevated bilirubin because the liver's not processing um, the bilirubin properly. So I thought, uh-oh, I had this for five years, maybe I've got liver cancer. But I felt healthy, okay? So I, so because I had it in front of me, and the doctor had never mentioned this to me, it had been like that for five years, because I went back all my five years of previous um, uh, reports that I had and said, look at my, I've got an elevated bilirubin, what's going on here? Is there something wrong with me? But I feel healthy. And he said, no, you've got Gilbert's syndrome. So that's a normal condition where about five to 10 percent of the population have slightly elevated um, levels of bilirubin because the enzyme that processes the bilirubin, the glucuronidase, which we'll talk about in the liver lecture, isn't quite as active in this small, this smaller subset of individuals. So there's kind of a, a syndrome, a condition without a biological consequence. So that's something I picked up. I never knew that. It was very interesting to me. So by reading your own um, differential count and all the other, because they do hormones, you know, all, all sorts of things is going to be in there that you can look at to see if there's something going on. Useful to do. There you go. A little bit over time for today. So which of the following contains a neurotoxin? Neurotoxin. 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 Okay, it kills the hel helminthic worms with a neurotoxin. Go back in the slide. All right, let's take a five minute break and at 22, we shall resume for hematopoiesis.
in progress. Okay, so so we now we know the composition of blood, the cellular components and the non-cellular components. So where do, do the cellular components of blood come from? That's what we're looking at now. That's what hematopoiesis is. That is the formation of the cellular components of blood. So we want to be able to understand the different pathways by which um, hematopoiesis occurs both in fetal and in postpartum life because it's different in the fetus than it is in um, after birth. We, we need to understand that there's actually two major pathways for hematopoiesis. There's a myeloid pathway that gives rise to everything except the lymphocytes, and that's the lymphoid lineage. And then we need to know the steps, all the different intermediate forms of those two, uh, of the different um, components of hematopoiesis, and how to identify and distinguish some of those different cell types. So now you'll recall here are the cell types that we looked at. Here's our red blood cells, here's our eosinophils, here's our basophils, here's our lymphocytes, here's our uh, monocytes, neutrophils, platelets. So if we look at the process of hematopoiesis, it's different in the fetus to the adult, okay? And in fact, there's three, three stages of hematopoiesis in the fetus which roughly corresponds to each of the three trimesters. So in the first trimester, we get primitive erythroblasts, precursors to red blood cells, which are produced in the yolk sac. In the second trimester, we have what is called the hepatosplenothymic phase. Hepato, liver, spleno, spleen, thymic, thymus. So liver, spleen, thymus, hepatosplenothymic phase produces precursors of the granulocytes, okay, and precursors of megakaryocytes and more definitive erythroblasts. And then after the second trimester, we start to get the medullary, the medullary lymphatic phase. So medullo is referring to the bone marrow cavity. Lymphatic is talking, is referring to uh, accumulation in lymph nodes in various um, regions of the, of the um, lymphatic system. So if we look at this sequence where we're seeing different locations of hematopoiesis, it turns out that this sequence follows the phylogenetic development of hematopoiesis and the immune system in vertebrates. Okay, so ontogeny follows phylogeny. That's a very common theme. So they used to say that um, embryological development recapitulates evolution. No, no, that's an oversimplification, a gross but it follows basic themes, okay? You can follow basic fundamental themes that have occurred through evolution that you will see repeated to some extent in fetal development. And I talked about bone development, right? I talked about how cartilage came first, followed by bone. Ontogeny follows phylogeny, same sort of thing. So you see, see the same sort of sequence um, of ontogeny following phylogeny relating to hematopoiesis and to the development of the lymphoid system. So you can see here, for instance, in the most primitive vertebrates, jawless fish, they just have very loose and non-encapsulated lymphoid tissues, which is what we, which is a very primitive component of lymphatic tissue. Then you start to see some encapsulated organs, and then last, it's in bone marrow, see? And we don't see bone marrow hematopoiesis until um, the third trimester and then into the adult. We'll come back to this slide later. So if we want to look at bone marrow, it's not easy. You've got to get it out of the bone. So here are some different locations that typically are used to aspirate bone marrow from an individual. They might want to take out bone marrow if they think they have sort of have some sort of um, cancer of the bone marrow, right? That's usually one of the one of the major reasons. So you can sample bone marrow from these locations. In a baby, it's not so simple. So usually they take it from the tibia, as shown here. So hematopoiesis all starts out with one common progenitor cell, this hemocytoblast, which we call a pluripotential stem cell. Okay, Pluripotential stem cell, that means that it can divide and differentiate into all of the other components of the blood that we've discussed. Then this pluripotential stem cell bifurcates into two pathways. One pathway, 
is the lymphoid system, which gives rise to lymphocytes. The other pathway gives rise to everything else. It's the so-called myeloid lineage. The myeloid lineage will further differentiate and divide into the erythrocytic pathway, the megakaryocyte platelets pathway, the three granulocytes, and monocytes. Okay, so this bifurcation is myeloid, which is everything except the lymphocytic pathway. And we're going to look primarily at the erythrocytic pathway and the granulocytic pathway. They're the two pathways that I um, expect you to know. The others I'm going to show you some slides, but I don't expect you to identify them because it's more it's kind of more complicated. So here are some trends that we see during myeloid hematopoiesis. You can see from the very primitive stem cell, the potentiality declines. That means as those cells progressively differentiate, right, they, can't, can, they can no longer reproduce and replace themselves as a more primitive form. They're going down the pathway of differentiation. And during this process, their mitotic, mitotic activity picks up and then it stops once they become the mature formed element of the blood that we've identified. Okay, as shown here. Um, in addition to a reduction in potentiality, there's a reduction in self-renewing capacity. They're no longer as mitotically active. This is all controlled by growth factors. And of course, at the end, we get, hopefully, the normal differentiated functional activity and morphology of the various leukocytes that we and red blood cells that we have been discussing. So sometimes, during this process of hematopoiesis, you can get the inappropriate Di um, differentiation and division of some of these intermediate forms, okay? Some of these intermediate forms, and that's what we recognize as a leukemia or a lymphoma, okay? You've got these intermediate forms that are, they're not progressing to the final formed element of blood that we identified in the last lecture. So then you basically have a functional deficit of that final end product. You've got these intermediate forms that are proliferating like crazy in the leukemia and we're not getting a fully formed um, component of blood. Now if we look at bone marrow where this occurs, we can talk about red and yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow means that the um, hematopoietic tissue is very active. As a person gets older, this hematopoiesis declines and the tissue is replaced by adipose, by fat cells. Okay. So we've got a replacement now of um, hematopoietic tissue with fat cells. So there's a gradual decline in the capacity for hematopoiesis as a person ages. And of course, this occurs all in the bone marrow, postpartum, after birth. And of course, for, this, for these components of the um, blood to get out of the bone marrow into the circulatory system, we have to have blood vessels that penetrate through the bone marrow and occur within the bone marrow as shown here. So obviously the blood vessels not only act as a conduit for the components of um, hematopoiesis to get out into the vasculature, but also to bring in um, oxygen and nutrients and so on to provide for the um, viability of those components of hematopoiesis. In the bone marrow, in addition to the hematopoietic cells that are undergoing um, division and differentiation, we have stromal cells. And these stromal cells act as support cells. They're secreting factors that provide a microenvironment that can induce hematopoiesis within the bone marrow cavity. So we can see now a schematic of bone marrow. So what do we see? We see endothelial cells right, lining some of the sinusoidal spaces. So this would be a component of the endosteum, right? Some endothelial cells, as well as um, the other bone forming cells. We see um, granulocytes, okay, the eosinophil, basophil, and um, neutrophils being produced. We see some of these stromal cells I just talked about. We see red blood cells being produced in um, adjacent to macrophages, which are very important for erythropoiesis. We see megakaryocytes that are shedding bits of cytoplasm to form platelets. And all of these cells then are released into this sinusoidal space that is continuous with a blood vessel 
then so all of these components can get out into the vasculature. Okay, so this slide is to remind me that bone marrow is also a very good reservoir of preserved DNA because you can imagine the DNA is in this middle bit of a bone marrow, so it can hold cells of the bone marrow for a long time. And one thing that they were able to do is, um, has anyone been to the La Brea Tar Pits Museum in Los Angeles? Yeah, so you saw some skeletons of the saber-toothed tiger, right? So what they did, they wanted to know who is the saber-toothed tiger most closely related to in the cats? Is it a tiger? <clears throat> is it a lion? Something else? So what they did was they took DNA from these skeletons of saber-toothed tigers that they got La Brea Tar Pits, which are 10,000-year-old skeletons, and they got samples of bone marrow from all of the different types of cats throughout the world and they compared them and they figured out that in fact the saber-toothed tiger is most closely related to the clouded leopard. So it's really a leopard, it's not a tiger, it's not a lion, it's more like a leopard. So they can do that sort of thing. So in terms of forensic pathology, you can get, um, like if you find a skeleton in the woods or you want to know who is this, like uh, in, um, who's that, that girl that disappeared um, in that island in the southern Caribbean? Natalie Holloway, right? Her father thought that they'd found some skeleton. He wants to know whether this skeleton is Natalie Holloway. So they're going to get the bones that they just dug up behind this house. They're going to get the bone marrow from that skeleton and they're going to compare the DNA sequence of that bone marrow to the parents and then he'll be able to tell for sure one way or the other whether that's Natalie or not, right? So again, because the bone marrow is a nice reservoir of DNA, it can become useful in forensic pathology for identifying who a skeleton may or may not be. Okay, so that's the bone marrow and the process of erythropoiesis, which is the process of red blood cell formation, of course occurs in the bone marrow. It starts out with our um, pluripotential stem cell, which can form um, either the myeloid lineage or the lymphoid lineage. We're going myeloid lineage, which can further differentiate into the erythropoietic pathway giving rise to red blood cells. And of course this is controlled by erythropoietin. Remember I talked about how erythropoietin is a protein produced by the kidney that then gets into the blood and circulates around into the bone marrow cavity where it stimulates the mitosis of the precursor forms of red blood cells. So erythropoietin derived from the kidney will stimulate blood, red blood cell mitosis. And here are some of the L components of erythropoiesis that we can see sometimes in the bone marrow. So we have a proerythroblast, we can identify a basophilic erythroblast, a polychromatophilic erythroblast, a normal blast, sometimes called an orthochromatophil, a reticular site, and of course then the mature red blood cell. So there is a reduction in size of the cell as they differentiate and divide, change in the ratio of mitochondria to RNA and an increase in hemoglobin content. So we need to be able to identify from the basophilic erythroblast down to the mature red blood cell, not the proerythroblast. So here's a basophilic erythroblast, poly, normal blast, reticular site, mature red blood cell. You can see there's a change in RNA content as you go down this sequence and an increase in hemoglobin content as you get to the mature erythrocyte. So here are the, this is the pathway we want to be able to identify. The first of which is the basophilic erythroblast, which is obviously the biggest of all these cells. They tend to reduce in size as they um, differentiate. The basophilic erythroblast quite often we can identify because the nucleus has this um, checkerboard appearance of the heterochromatin. See how it's clumpy? It's kind of, maybe we can call it checkerboard, right? The heterochromatin is very distinctly checkerboard, clumpy like this. Plus these cells are quite large and the cytoplasm is more uh, basophilic. This cell will then differentiate into a polychromatophilic erythroblast. And it's called a polychromatophilic erythroblast because it has two colors in the cytoplasm, hence polychromo. It has both the purple color and now it's producing more um, hemoglobin, so that gives rise to the, the salmon pink erythroblastic color. So in the poly, you'll see two colors in the cytoplasm, 
and also the nucleus is starting to condense somewhat. Eventually, the polychromatophil will undergo um, further nuclear condensation until you have a very dark, condensed nucleus with almost no cytoplasm around it, and we call that a normal blast. And the normal blast, with a very condensed nucleus, will then eject the nucleus to give rise to a reticulocyte, which is an early form of erythrocyte. So we need to be able to identify one, two, three, four, five cells here. So this whole process of erythropoiesis occurs in the bone marrow cavity around a central macrophage. So the macrophage um, is in a central area around this whole process. So we start out with our um, erythropoietin, stimulating the pro-erythroblast to differentiate into our basophilic erythroblast, which can undergo mitosis to form a poly polychromatophilic erythroblast. All of these cells are capable of undergoing mitosis and differentiation. The poly is the last cell type capable of mitosis because once this nucleus further condenses to form a normal blast, the DNA is no longer in an open conformation to facilitate mitosis. So then the normal blast is the first cell of this lineage no longer capable of mitosis. The normal blast ejects its nucleus to give us a reticulocyte and that nucleus is phagocytosed by this central macrophage. So the macrophage is helping to recycle nuclear content during this process of erythropoiesis. Then the reticulocyte is ejected, gets into the circulatory system, and rapidly becomes a erythrocyte, a red blood cell. So here's our normal blast, condensed nucleus. Quite often you'll see the nucleus off to one side because it is making its way to the perimeter where eventually it will be ejected from the cytoplasm to form what is left as a reticulocyte. So this is what reticulocytes look like. There's no nucleus, but there's still a fair amount of RNA left in the cytoplasm, and it's that RNA that we're staining with, in this case, this, this super vital stain, the crystal blue. So this is a reticulocyte, and then that RNA breaks down and eventually we get a mature red blood cell. Okay, so that was erythropoiesis. The other pathway that we need to be familiar with is granular poiesis, also part of this myeloid lineage. And the, the, the granular poiesis that we typically talk about is the neutrophil granular poiesis, because remember neutrophils are about 70% of um, the uh, white blood cell count, so that's the most common, so that's the one where you're going to see mostly um, the granular poiesis in the bone marrow. So we're, we're going to be doing the central one, but it's basically the same for both basophils and eosinophils. So the promyelocyte, we have a promyelocyte, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, band cell, neutrophil. The promyelocyte is the largest of the cells and it has non-specific granules, so these are lysosomes non-specific granules. Then this will dif differentiate into a myelocyte, which now has acquired specific granules. So it's going to have both specific granules and non-specific granules. So the specific granules will be neutrophilic if it's the neutrophil pathway, or the eosinophilic granules with the stripe if it's an eosinophil, or those large basophilic granules if it's going to be the basophilic pathway. But we typically do the neutrophilic, gran the neutrophilic pathway because that's the pathway we see most common. So myelocyte has both specific and nonspecific granules and a more or less rounded to oval nucleus. That nucleus then becomes shaped like a, um, a bean, a kidney bean. So when we see a kidney bean shaped nucleus, we call that a metamyelocyte. Then when that kidney bean further elongates to form like a horseshoe, we call that a band cell. Remember I showed you a picture of a band cell on that one of those first slides of the previous lecture. It was up in the upper right-hand corner, plus all the other different uh, formed elements of blood. So that's a band cell. And then, of course, it further differentiates into a neutrophil. So just to recap, promyelocyte has the nonspecific granules. The, now the myelocyte with the still the oval-shaped nucleus has acquired specific granules. Once that nucleus becomes bean-shaped, we call it a metamyelocyte. And once that 
nucleus becomes more like a, a horseshoe, we call that a band cell. And then once that horseshoe nucleus lobulates, we call that the mature granulocyte, in this case, a neutrophil. So here it is again. Promyelocyte with the nonspecific granules. Myelocyte now has, acqu has acquired specific granules, still oval-shaped nucleus. And then once the nucleus becomes bean-shaped, we call it a metamyelocyte. So basically, if you're going to identify these guys, you should go based upon the nuclear morphology. The myelocyte is oval to round. The metamyelocyte is the kidney bean. The band cell is the horseshoe-shaped nucleus. And then, of course, we have the final product. So here they are again, shown here. We'll look at these in the lab. Now, sometimes you may find an excess of band cells in the blood, OK? So what, what does that mean if you've got an excess? You, typically, there might be 1% in the blood. But if you've got more than 1%, that would suggest, particularly if it's a neutrophilic band cell, that you may have some bacterial infection because the body now has ramped up the production of neutrophils to counteract some sort of infection. Now, we, we can also look at monopoiesis, also part of the myeloid lineage. But I don't expect you to um, memorize this. But you can see there's a few intermediaries giving rise to macrophages and some of the different types of macrophage uh, types of cells that we've discussed. And also, uh, thrombopoiesis is the formation of platelets. So you can see here in thrombopoiesis, also I don't expect you to memorize any of this. In thrombopoiesis, what happens is, is the cells duplicate their DNA. They don't divide. So they're duplicating the DNA. They become 4N, 8N, 16N, right? They become these huge cells with, which are polyploid, multiples of DNA material and a large cytoplasm which then is sh they shed little fragments of cytoplasm as platelets. So you can see here a megakarrier blast, megakarrier site, and little fragments of cytoplasm being shed. So what can go wrong? Well, sometimes, you know, I'm sure you've heard the terms lymphomas and leukemias. So a lymphoma typically is a cancer of, lymphatic, of the lymphoid system. So lymphocytes, we can have Hodgkin's disease, which is characterized by the presence of a large cell type giant Reed Sternberg cells, and also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'm sure you've heard that term. Um, basically, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is something that doesn't have a lymphoma that doesn't have these Reed Sternberg cells. If the, the cancer of the blood involves one of the um, myeloid lineage, it's going to be a leukemia. Okay, So cancer of leukocytes and precursors. And we can have both acute and chronic Leukemias. So acute means that the cell that is cancerous is an early form of the pathway. So that's a, usually a bad prognosis. Or if it's chronic, that means that the cell that is cancerous is further down the pathway. So these are more mature, so these tend to be less aggressive. So that would be a somewhat better prognosis than acute um, myelogenous leukemia. So here we have our myelogenous leukemias again. The myeloid lineage, everything except uh, lymphocytes, occurs in the bone marrow. We classified based upon the, um, which one of these components of um, myelogenous uh, differentiation it is defective for. And of course, we have both acute and chronic disease. Now, recently, in the last five to 10 years, there's been a drug that's been used, Gleevec, which actually targets one of the enzymes on these cells, which has been very useful, um, and it's doubled the survival rate of people with chronic myelogenous leukemia. So that's been a bit of a breakthrough um, for treating patients with myelogenous leukemias. And of course, the whole causal effect um, of these leukemias is that the tumor cells are, placing, are replacing the normal hematopoietic tissue. So this cell, this slide, I'm showing you, I don't expect you to memorize this, but this shows you how you might be able to identify, but you don't have to, different cancerous cells in these different lineages. So this is the final end product here is a granulocyte, neutrophil granulocyte. So this would be acute myeloid um, leukemia, right? So the very early 
cells of this um, neutrophil pathway have become cancerous. So this is acute, this is acute. This is, these down here, these are more chronic, so this would be a better prognosis than if it was acute. You can have an acute myeloid leukemia of the monocyte macrophage pathway, or for red blood cells, here you've got an acute myeloid leukemia, and also for platelets, acute myeloid leukemia. So some of these different early forms of hematopoiesis can be identified and then used to figure out what um, kind of leukemia that they have. But you don't have to know, you don't have to memorize that. I'm just showing you that because it can be done. Okay, so when, we take, when we're looking for a leukemia, quite often we'll do a bone marrow biopsy. So here's a bit of bone marrow that's been put on a microscope slide and at higher power. So this is the bone here and this is the marrow containing many, many different cells. So that's normal marrow, and if you look at normal marrow, you're going to see a bunch of cells of this density. Whereas if, it's, if you've got leukemia, see how much darker it stains? That's because you've got more cells packed into the same volume. See, it's much darker, greater cell packing, and of course, these are um, the, the, the cells of the leukemia that have been proliferating and packing together. So then you would be able to look at this slide and um, diagnose leukemia as opposed to a normal condition. Okay, that went quickly. Which of the following was not derived from the myeloid progenitor stem cell? Okay, not derived from the myeloid progenitor stem cell. Okay, do you remember the myeloid lineage versus the lymphoid lineage. Remember, everything is derived from the myeloid lineage except for the lymphocytes. There's that just one, so bifurcation, myeloid one way, lymphocytes the other. Okay, five minute break, and at 10 past, can we do the lab? And then we'll be done. 10 past. Okay, very good. And we shall push on with the laboratory. Okay, I got it. So let's now look at some of these cells that we've been discussing in the last two lectures and see if we can identify them. So firstly, this is what I hope you'll be able to do. Firstly, identify these different cells, okay, specifically in a lab session, and um, understand their relationship to hematology, hematopoiesis today, and in the next couple of lectures where some of these cells can specifically reside in tissues and organs. And you really want to be able to look for identifying features of these different cells, specific features that allows you to say this is one cell type and not another. And of course, we want to know the function of these cells. So um, we talked about biopsies. This is the, taking blood is the most common biopsy. First thing that's done, we talked about making a blood smear. The reason that you pull the top slide back up to the here is that if you put this slide in front of the droplet, you would push it over the smear and you'd ruptured many of the cells by pulling the slide back up to this droplet and letting the droplet form um, and run across between the two slides and then pushing it forward, it doesn't rupture the cells. So then you can identify the cells because the cytoplasm hasn't been ruptured. So here is a typical blood sample on a microscope slide that we could look at. So when you look at this, all of these are red blood cells, right? So there's not many leukocytes the nucleated cells, not many at all. This is normal blood. So these are all red blood cells. Here's a couple of nucleated cells, which we probably can't really identify that clearly. So this is what you're going to see. So you need a lot of, a lot of blood to be able to get a really good differential count on the leukocytes. So that's why having a machine do it instead of us looking under a microscope is so much more efficient and so much more accurate. So firstly, the red blood cells, 
Easy to identify because there's no nucleus, right? Easy to identify. Any questions so far? And the very early forms of red blood cells are the reticulocytes. So once the normocyte, the normoblast ejects the nucleus, what's left is the reticulocyte. And we can see if we stain with a supravital stain such as crystal violet, we can see remnants of RNA, either individual or um, rough endoplasmic reticulum RNA that is, has remained in the cytoplasm. Um, so then if we see this RNA material and also look at the larger diameter of the cell, we would recognize this as a reticulocyte. So then with a little bit of time, this RNA will break down and the cell will shrink a little bit in size down to then what we recognize as a uh, red blood cell, an erythrocyte. Any questions on this one? Okay, so here's the scanning electron micrograph of some of these structures. Here's our red blood cells, donut shaped, nice flexibility. Here's some little platelet fragments, and this is a uh, lymphocyte. Any questions? Okay, so then these are the guys we have to be able to identify. The top three are the granulocytes, the, neutro the neutrophils with some granules the eosinophils with the eosinophilic granules, the basophils with the basophilic granules, and of course all three of these also have lobulated nuclei. So that's the combination of the granules and the lobulated nuclei that allows us to classify these as the granulocytes, as written here. In contrast, the A granulocytes don't have prominent granules and they don't have typically a lobulated nucleus. The monocyte might have a kind of a weird shaped nucleus, but it's usually not particularly lobulated. So you would identify the monocyte because it's not any of these other four cell types. Okay, that's usually the way to do it. Any questions? Okay, so here's our neutrophil. We can see the highly lobulated nucleus. And the cytoplasm contains neutrophilic granules. They're not strongly eosinophilic, they're not strongly basophilic, so we would say this is a neutrophil. Any questions? Here's more neutrophils, okay, lobulated nucleus, lobulated nucleus, here we have that bar body, the X chromosome that has been ejected to one side. Any questions? Say again? Yes, this arrow is on the bar body right here. Questions? Okay, so here we can see actually a band cell next to a more mature neutrophil. So this band cell, there's, uh, you know, maybe you might see normally 1% of band cells in the normal blood as they've been released from the bone marrow cavity. And so then this nuclear material will become more lobulated. And so then we will recognize this cell as a neutrophil based upon the neutrophilic granules in the cytoplasm. And of course, most of the time we're going to see band cells of the neutrophilic form because remember, most of the leukocytes, most of the nucleated cells in blood are neutrophils, 70%, right? So most of the time you're going to see neutrophils. You're not going to see basophils or eosinophils hardly ever because they're so infrequent. Yes? What's the same size? No, no, the, the neutrophils, basophils and and eosinophils are different sizes. I think the basophils are the biggest. Then maybe eosinophils and neutrophils are probably the smaller. There was another question. You may see the band form of the other ones, but it's pro probably very rare. They do exist. You may see the band form of a basophil and an eosinophil in blood, but highly unlikely because remember, they're like just a couple of percent or less of all of the leukocytes, whereas the 
neutrophils are 70% of the leukocytes. So if you see a band form, just based upon percentages, it's most likely going to be a neutrophil. It is possible to see a basophil or a eosinophil band form, but highly unlikely. Yes. Yes, this is a neutrophil. Yeah, because of the lobulation. Any other questions? Okay, so here is a section, electron micrograph section through a neutrophil. We can see the different types of granules, the specific and non-specific granules. Okay, the non-specific, these would be like lysosomes and more specific granules, lighter stained. And you can see the nucleus here. It's kind of looks like it's chopped up into pieces, but remember it's highly lobulated. So, you know, the, the connection between this one and this one is in a different plane. It would have been, you know, cut over here and this one and this one in a different plane. So that is telling us that this was highly lobulated nucleus of this neutrophil. Questions? Okay, so here are some more neutrophils showing different examples. See how lobulated the nucleus is, lobulated. And here we can see the arrow pointing to a bar body, the X chromosome being ejected to one side from the rest of the nucleus. Any questions? So, you know, this, I'm showing you this because I want you to be able to identify a neutrophil compared to an eosinophil, right? So you look at this, these eosinophils and look how these granules are somewhat larger and highly eosinophilic, stain different color. And also, the nucleus isn't as lobulated as a neutrophil, okay? There's a difference in the lobulation. Any questions on this eosinophil slide? Okay, here is an electron micrograph of an eosinophil. So here the distinguishing histological feature is the, this um, specific granule containing the internum and the externum in the granule. The internum, this stripe, is very distinctive. The externum, obviously, then making the internum much more prominently distinctive. And you only see this sort of stripey granule in eosinophils. So I can't think of another cell type where you'd see that. So if you saw this slide histologically, because we have these granules containing the internum and externum, you should be able to identify this as an eosinophil and not confuse it with anything else. Any questions? Okay, so here are some more eosinophils shown here. Don't know what that's about. Um, but you can see the eosinophilic granules here. And what is this cell? Neutrophil. We crashed. <laughs> it was a neutrophil. That one, yeah, that this one, this one. Is it was it that one? Yeah. No, not that one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because yeah, this is a, neut a neutrophil because we see the well firstly the lobulated nucleus and the granules aren't anywhere near as prominently stained as this adjacent eosinophil, and also we see this bar body, right? Which you're gonna see a bar body probably more so than any other cell type because the nucleus is so condensed and lobulated that it's pushing it out. And here's another neutrophil. Here you can see the granules um, containing the stripiness of the eosinophilic granule. Any questions on this one? Yes. You may see a bar body in a basophil or a eosinophil, but highly unlikely. You may, but I've never seen one shown. Chances are it's going to be a neutrophil.
Question? This is an eosinophil, this EM, yeah. Here's the striped eosinophilic granule. Other questions? Yes? This, no, this is an eosinophil. This is, these are red blood cells. This is the eosinophil. See, it's, um, firstly, look at the nucleus. It's nowhere near as lobulated as this neutrophil, and it's got prominent eosinophilic granules. Other questions? Okay, basophils. Basophils, the rarest of the uh, leukocytes in normal blood, and very prominent basophilic granules. You can see how prominent they are. The nucleus is lobulated, but at the light microscopic view, not always so easily to see. You can see these prominent basophilic granules. Any questions on this one? Now, here's a bunch of basophils, different appearances. You can barely, or if at all, see the nucleus because the basophilic granules have just completely covered the nucleus here. But the basophilic granules are huge and they're dark purple stained. Okay? And in this electron micrograph, you can see how big these basophilic granules are. And you can see the lobulated nucleus. And again, because this is a thin section, you know, the, it'd be continuous with this section, but it's cut through in a different plane. Any questions on this one? Basophils? OK, lymphocytes, we're going to talk about next week. 28% um, of leukocyte volume of percentages, uh, typically you can identify them because the round oval shaped nucleus, thin rim of cytoplasm. And it's not a granulocyte, it's not a monocyte, so it is a lymphocyte. Any questions on this? Yes. It's not a granulocyte because there's no granules in the cytoplasm, there's no eosinophilic, basophilic, or neutrophilic granules. The nucleus is not lobulated, right? So it's not one of the granulocytes. The basophils, the eosinophils, neutrophils have a highly lobulated nucleus. So it's not that. The only thing you might confuse it with would be a monocyte. Monocyte usually has some sort of change in shape to the nucleus. I'll show you that momentarily. Whereas this cell has a very uniform oval to round nucleus. So it's a lymphocyte. Other questions? So here are some more lymphocytes. You can see oval to rounded nucleus thin rim of cytoplasm. Here's the electron micrograph of it. Questions? OK, monocytes. This is the one people have perhaps the most difficulty identifying. You can see the nucleus has a little bit of lobulation. If this was normal blood, OK, it's, and it's not a band cell because the thickness of the band is too thick. That's what you might think it was, a band cell. But in, if I said normal blood, we wouldn't be looking for band cells. So chances are it's a monocyte. There's no granules in the cytoplasm, and the nucleus is not, so that's not a granulocyte. And the nucleus is neither oval or round, so it's not a lymphocyte. So by default, we might say this is a monocyte in normal blood. Any questions? Say again. What did I say? The hmm, what was the answer? You might mistake it for a band cell, an immature neutrophil, but it's a little too thick for that in terms of nuclear width. Yes. Someone that isn't sick, okay, and it's not non-diseased. So here are a bunch more monocytes. You can see that the nuclear morphology is quite variable, OK? Um, but this is normal blood. So um, the, the, we're not looking at precursors of hematopoiesis here. We're looking at normal blood. So again, we don't see prominent granules. So it's not a granulocyte. So that eliminates three cell types. We don't see a round to oval shaped nucleus, so it's not a lymphocyte. Here's a lymphocyte next to it, right? So if I showed you this slide, you say, hey, this is a lymphocyte. What is this? It's not a granulocyte, so it must be a monocyte. Okay? 
Any questions on this one? I like this slide because this looks like a duck. You've got the beak and the head and the neck and the body and the tail. You could hang this over a Chinese restaurant. Peking duck. OK, platelets. Platelets, remember, are fragments. I didn't offend anyone by that, did I? Boy, I like that slide. I really do. Platelets are fragments of megakaryocytes. So remember, platelets play a role in, um, in, in blood clotting. Okay? And you can see how small these platelets are in this, this um, blood vessel. Here's an endothelial cell. So this is, and there's no nucleus here. This is just fragments. And then if we look at a, an electron micrograph of a platelet, you can see there's the, the hylomere at the perimeter. So these are microtubules and microfilaments, right? Microtubules and microfilaments are actin filaments. They kind of hold the structure together. And then in the middle, we have the granulomere with different types of granules that can promote blood clotting. Any questions on this one? No nucleus, though, right? OK, bone marrow, remember, this is bone. We hopefully can recognize bone, the bits, spicules and trabeculae of bone. And then the marrow is within the bone itself, the marrow cavity. And if, it's, if we see yellow marrow, that means that the person is a bit older and the hematopoiesis is not as active as in a younger person. Bone marrow smear, if we want to look at it. Bone marrow smear, again, you can see all these different hematopoietic components. I wouldn't expect you to be able to identify them at this level of resolution. It's a little bit too low. People that do this are experts. Uh, in the field, and of course they use uh, machines these days also to help them identify things. Okay, so we want to be able to identify the erythroblastic series from the basophils down, basophilic erythroblasts, and the um, granulocytic series from the promyelocyte down. So let's look first at the erythroblastic series. So here's the erythroblastic Basophilic erythroblast, right? So it's this guy. Look at the nucleus. See how it's got this checkerboard arrangement of heterochromatin and also the cytoplasm is basophilic? That's what you see here. You've got this checkerboard arrangement of heterochromatin and the cytoplasm is basophilic. Any questions on this one? And then the next cell type is the polychromatophilic erythroblast. Poly because we have two different colors in the cytoplasm. We've got more of an um, eosinophilic pink color and still a residue of um, basophilia from the previous cell slide. So that would be a polychromatophil. Any questions on this one? And then beyond the poly, we start to get the normoblast. Normoblast typically is pretty easy to identify because the nucleus is completely condensed. Okay. It's really small and condensed. And also, you can see it's a little bit eccentric. It's off to the edge because, remember, the normal blast will eventually eject the nucleus. And here is the nucleus on the perimeter getting ready to be kicked out of the cytoplasm. Small nucleus, very condensed, uniform staining of the nucleus. Any questions on this one? And then once that nucleus is ejected, we have a reticular site with remnants of RNA, no nucleus, remnants of RNA, which can stain up with um, a vital stain such as crystal violet. So if we see this cell with blotches of um, reticular material in the cytoplasm, we would recognize that as a reticular site in comparison to the more mature red blood cell once those that RNA, the, that reticular material is degraded. Any questions on reticular sites? OK, so that is the erythroblastic series. So to recap, you should be able to identify the basophilic erythroblast, the poly, the normoblast, the reticulocyte, and the erythroblast, the erythrocyte. Now we need to be able to go through the granulocytic series, and we always do the neutrophilic granulocytic series since they are the most common. So recall, the promyelocyte just has nonspecific granules. The 
and a rounded nucleus. The myelocyte now has acquired both specific and keeps the non-specific granules, still has an oval nucleus. Then that myelocyte nucleus becomes bean-shaped, we call that a metamyelocyte. The bean eventually becomes more like a band or a horseshoe, that's the band form, and then we get the mature neutrophil. So the, the nuclear morphology is critical to identification of the granulocytes, okay? The myelocyte, metamyelocyte band, and the final mature form. So here's our myelocyte, the more or less oval-shaped nucleus. Questions on this one? Now you can see a slight indentation here. Remember, all of these cell types that we're talking about, they are in a continuum, and we are identifying discrete forms that we can say this is distinct from this one. But there will be occasions where you get something kind of a little bit in between because that's what happens. It changes from one to the other, right? So don't expect that the kind of it's punctate that jumps from one to the other. There's a continuum, but of course we're going to ask questions on one, ones that are very typical of those distinct forms. But that's why you can see this slight indentation here because this myelocyte is getting ready to turn into a metamyelocyte where you've got more of that kidney bean shaped nucleus. Here's our metamyelocyte here with the kidney bean shaped nucleus, right? Any questions on this one? And then from the metamyelocyte we get the band form where the nucleus now is more like a horseshoe shape. So that's the band form of the granulocytic series. Any questions on this one? And then, of course, we get the mature form. Now, megakaryocytes, remember, these are huge cells. So you should be able to identify this. If I told you this is a smear, blood, blood, bone marrow smear, and I said, what is this cell from normal bone marrow? It has to be a megakaryocyte, right? Because, remember, they're huge. They're polyploid. They don't divide. They duplicate their DNA and they keep duplicating, duplicating, duplicating from 2N to 64N and then little chunks of the, the um, cytoplasm is shed as platelets. So it has to be a megakaryocyte. Okay? Any questions? Another megakaryocyte. Look how big it is compared to all of the other cell types around it. It's huge, right? So it's a megakaryocyte. Okay, there you go. Here's our question. Identify this cell type from granulopoiesis. Granulopoiesis. And remember I said in granulopoiesis, the um, thing that you want to look at is the nuclear morphology. Okay? Think about it in your head for a minute. Granular poesis. Look at the nucleus. What? How would you describe that nucleus? What does that look like? Kidney bean, right? So, metamyelocyte, because that's a kidney bean. So beyond, if I progress further, it would be the horseshoe shape band form, but it's not. It's still at the kidney bean. So there you go. All right, so much for the lab today. And then next week, we have a continuation where we're going to look at the distribution of the various, we're going to look at um, the immune system, lymphocytes, and also the distribution of these different cell types within the immune system and the organs of the immune system.